our researchers at hairgod.com have been diving deep into the scientific literature. Now, what they found is going to surprise you. In this video, we're going to share six hair loss studies that the big pharma companies do not want you to know about. If you're looking to regrow your hair and stop hair loss, these studies are fascinating. The final study that we'll be sharing, which is about combining two popular hair loss treatments that I can guarantee that you'll already know about, actually show a four times increase in hair counts. You simply have to watch this entire video. So guys, let's get straight into it. The top six studies that pharmaceutical companies do not want you to know about. Guys, some of the results that we'll cover today are so unreal that you'd think that I'm making it up. Well, I am not. It is all peer-reviewed academic science published in mainstream journals. And I've put links to all of the studies in the description, so if you do want to further your own knowledge, I highly recommend that you check out these studies for yourself. Number one, Botox injections can reverse hair loss. Did you know that a couple of Botox sessions are enough to produce hair regrowth comparable to finasteride? That's what a group of Canadian doctors discovered in 2010, and they published their findings in the Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Now, wait a second. Before we look at the actual results, why on earth would Botox reverse hair loss? That stuff is for wrinkles, right? Well, that is true. Botox injections are usually given to soothe age-related wrinkles. But actually, that is only a side effect of their biological effect, which is to relax muscles. And the doctors who conducted this study were motivated by the scalp tension theory of baldness. According to this idea, chronic tension in the scalp leads to a reduction in blood flow. Because of this reduced blood flow, the follicles become starved of oxygen and the nutrients that they need to support a healthy hair growth cycle. The result? Progressive hair follicle miniaturization and eventually baldness. By relaxing the scalp muscles, and I quote from the paper here, Botox loosens the scalp, reducing pressure on the perforating vasculature, thereby increasing blood flow and oxygen concentration. The enzymatic conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone is oxygen dependent. In low oxygen environments, the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone is favored whereas in high oxygen environments, more testosterone is converted to estradiol. So by loosening the scalp muscles, the injections were presumed to have a double effect. A, they increase blood flow to the scalp, and B, they reduce the local conversion of testosterone to DHT. So let's take a look at the results. 40 men were recruited and completed the study. They aged between 19 to 57 and were all Norwood Hamilton 2 to 4. These men were treated with Botox on two sessions spaced 24 weeks apart. Hair counts increased by an average of 18%, which was a highly statistically significant result. A whopping 75% of subjects responded positively to the treatment. And as you can see in these before and after photos, some of the men did see dramatic regrowth. And there were no side effects. Pretty impressive stuff for only two treatment sessions, don't you think? The next study is the progression of androgenetic alopecia matches the degree of scalp tension. So guys, until a few decades ago, the idea that scalp tension was ultimately responsible for hair loss was a major mainstream theory in dermatology. Unfortunately, with the arrival of finasteride, the theory took a back step to the androgen theory of hair loss, and almost all research has since focused on DHT. And while DHT is certainly involved in hair loss, there's a good case to be made that it becomes a problem in combination with scalp tension. I just showed you what can happen when you treat the scalp tension with Botox injections. Now I want to share the results of a 2015 study that modeled the degree of tension in the scalp. The study used a common engineering method called finite element analysis. This is a computerized method where you break down an object into thousands of individual components. And using mathematical methods, you can predict how the objects will react to external forces, like being bent, twisted, crashing into something, being heated, vibrated, and so on. So on the top of our head, underneath the scalp skin, sits a sheet of connective tissue called the gallia aponeurotica. Gallia is Latin for helmet, and looking at the image, we can see how this tissue got its name. Now, what's really fascinating about the gallia is that pattern hair loss is always confined to parts overlying it. 
On the back of the head, the gallia gives way to the occipitalis muscle, and on the sides around the ear, there is temporal muscle. And it's these parts that never go bold. Coincidence? I highly doubt it. The finite element analysis modeled the degree of stress or tension exerted on the gallia by the surrounding muscles. This was the result. Areas with the lighter blue are those with the highest stress, and those in the darker blue are the areas with the least stress. If you think this graphic looks vaguely familiar, then you are not mistaken. Let's put it next to a graphic of the famous Hamilton Norwood scale, which shows the progression of pattern boldness. The similarity is astonishing. Those parts of the scalp with the highest tension are also the ones that go bold first. They are then followed by those with intermediate tension, and the ones with the least tension are the last ones to go. Statistically, the chances of this overlap being a coincidence are less than one in a thousand. Guys, what do you think of this? When you take results like this and then consider them in combination with the Botox study that we just discussed, you start to get an idea that there's much more to hair loss than just DHT. I've linked to a video in the description that you simply must watch if you're interested in learning more about scalp tension and male pattern boldness. The third study is that early onset boldness is linked to metabolic syndrome and heart disease. So companies like to paint a very simple picture of hair loss. There's something wrong with your hair, probably caused by a genetic predisposition to dihydrotestosterone. So pop a pill or apply some topical medication and the problem is fixed, or at the very least it's been treated. If only things were that simple. Historically, hair loss in men wasn't as prevalent as it is today. That's a fact. And even today, in cultures that haven't adopted a highly processed, westernized diet, it is relatively rare. So while DHT certainly does play a role, likely in combination with chronic scalp tension, there are lifestyle factors that are very likely causing men to lose their hair. Now, there is very substantial literature on this topic by this point. So I'll show you one representative paper that summarizes the available evidence from the past studies. It was published just two years ago and is written in a relatively simple language, so I'd encourage you to read it yourself if you're interested in the topic. It's open access, free to read, so I'll link you guys to it in the description below. Now, metabolic syndrome refers to a cluster of related health conditions in which insulin resistance features prominently. Let me first explain how insulin resistance works. When we consume junk foods that are high in processed carbs, the levels of sugar in our blood spikes. To deal with this spike, our pancreas releases insulin. The insulin attaches to various cells throughout our body and instructs them to absorb the sugar from the blood and use it for energy, as well as store it for future use. So insulin is essential in keeping our levels of blood sugar under control. But if we sustain ourselves on a long-term diet of processed or junk foods, our system is eventually overwhelmed and the insulin can no longer keep blood sugar levels under control. Our body has then become resistant to the effects of insulin. So when we refer to metabolic syndrome, we're talking about a constellation of conditions that feature insulin resistance, obesity, and hypertension. As you'd expect, people with metabolic syndrome are at a dramatically increased risk of complications like heart attacks, strokes, and diabetes. Insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome can lead to hair loss in a number of ways. The chronically elevated blood sugar levels damage the blood vessels, and this restricts the supply of oxygen and nutrients to the hair follicles. Insulin also regulates the production of androgens. In particular, increased insulin levels lead to a rise in freely circulating testosterone, some of which is then converted to excess DHT. Given all of this, it's no surprise that numerous studies reported an increased association between androgenetic alopecia and metabolic syndrome, heart disease, hypertension, and obesity. In other words, men with pattern hair loss are disproportionately likely to also have one of these serious health conditions. Depending on the study, the risk can be as much as double compared to non-balding men. As the number of studies has continued to increase, even the mainstream media is now starting to report on this connection. There is simply too much data at this point to continue ignoring this link. So guys, the takeaway is that there is a lifestyle component to hair loss. There's more than just a genetic susceptibility to DHT. Sure, the genetic component is very real, and we've reported on it in previous videos. But you can't just resign yourself to the fact that you inherited the boldness genes and ignore things like your diet and your lifestyle. 
And this is why we always talk about taking a multi-pronged approach to naturally treating hair loss. And we recommend that this be based on a solid foundation of a healthy lifestyle, of which a proper nutrient-packed diet is key. The fourth study is that pumpkin seed oil regrows 40% of hairs in thinning areas. Now guys, speaking of diet, there are many published studies on naturally occurring DHT blockers that can boost hair regrowth in men. But today, I want to focus on the results of a 2014 study that looked at pumpkin seed oil. Pumpkin seed oil is considered by some researchers to be a natural alternative to powerful medications like finasteride and dutasteride. The oil is rich in phytosterols, a class of compounds known for their inhibitory effect on 5-alpha reductase. This is the enzyme necessary to convert testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. And it's also been reported to be an effective treatment for benign prostate enlargement, which is another condition thought to be linked to DHT. This particular study was conducted in Korea, and it was placebo-controlled, randomized, and double-blind. The men were between 20 to 65 years old and had mild to severe baldness from 2 to 5 on the Norwood scale. 37 men received 400 mg of pumpkin seed oil daily in capsules, and another 39 men received placebo. Treatment lasted 24 weeks. To evaluate the treatment efficacy, the researchers used hair counts in a small balding area of the scalp, as well as photographic assessments of the entire head by a blinded dermatologist. So the dermatologist studied the before and after photographs of each man and rated their hair regrowth on a 7-point scale. The scale ranged from minus 3 for severe deterioration to plus 3 for great improvement, and 0 meant there was no visible change. As you can see in this graph, on average, after only 12 weeks, there were already significant visible differences between the groups. These continued to become more pronounced until the end of the study at 24 weeks. 44% of men in the pumpkin seed oil group were rated as slightly or moderately improved, while almost all the rest were rated as unchanged. You can see some of the before and after comparisons in these photos. In the placebo group, on the other hand, only 7% improved, 64% were unchanged, and 28% deteriorated. In line with the photographic assessment by the dermatologist, there were also dramatic differences between the two groups in hair counts. At 24 weeks, the hair counts in the pumpkin seed oil had increased by an average of 40%, and the placebo by only 10%. These differences were highly statistically significant. What about side effects? Well, as you'd expect, the pumpkin seed oil was essentially free of side effects. One man complained of itching, and another of mild abdominal discomfort. And it's difficult to tell if these were even linked to the pumpkin seed oil in the first place. If you want to try pumpkin seed oil for your own hair loss, then you can easily pick it up in any health food store or an online vendor like Amazon. And at this point, it's worth mentioning the HairGuard DHT blocking supplement. Aside from pumpkin seed, it also contains saw palmetto which is perhaps the most widely used natural DHT blocker. It's also packed with other powerful DHT blockers like the reishi mushroom, stinging nettle, and more. A lot of these ingredients are very difficult to source, and they need to be stored correctly to get the maximum benefits. And the Hair Guard supplement has been sourced, extracted, and stored to bring you the highest quality end product. I've linked to the supplement in the description, and it comes with a 180-day money-back guarantee, so it's risk-free to try. The fifth study is that 95% of minoxidil users actually stop treatment within one year. So guys, we've discussed some taboo studies that show what you can achieve using natural hair loss treatments. Now, let's look at the flip side. Let's see, for example, the results that minoxidil users get in real life. Now, when it comes to minoxidil, we have loads of published reports on clinical trials. Some of this sponsored by the makers of minoxidil, but most of it was independent. But there is very little in terms of what you would call real-world data, with users of minoxidil who aren't participating in a clinical trial, who are just going to go to the pharmacy and buy minoxidil like regular consumers do. Well, thanks to this 2007 study out of Iran, we know what tends to happen in these cases. The study looked at 1,480 men who attended two private dermatology clinics in the city of Avaz. The men were all between 20 to 40 years old, and their hair loss had started in the last five years. So they were pretty good candidates for treatment. They were prescribed topical 5% minoxidil, the strongest version. And they were then followed up over the next five years to see how many stuck to treatment. The results are pretty astonishing. 
After six months, 55% of patients had discontinued treatment, rising to 95% after 12 months and 99% after two years. At the end of the five-year follow-up period, there was one patient who was still on treatment. The remaining 1,479 had all discontinued. By far the most common reasons the men gave for stopping the treatment were weak or non-existent hair growth. This reason accounted for two-thirds of cases. The second most common reasons were that they just couldn't be bothered sticking to the treatment. Now, this wasn't explicitly spelled out in the report, but I can tell you that upon stopping treatment, every single one of those men lost any new hair that they might have grown out, meaning that they would probably have been better off had they not started treatment in the first place. Minoxidil, like finasteride, is meant to be taken indefinitely, and this study suggests hardly any user will stick to it indefinitely. The final study that we're going to look at is that dermarolling boosts minoxidil results by four times. So in the previous study, we reviewed the rather disappointing data about minoxidil monotherapy, which is when you use minoxidil on its own. Now, in case you were thinking I'm being too harsh on minoxidil, I want to show you what happens when you combine it with microneedling, or dermarolling as it's probably more commonly known. The dermaroller is a simple handheld instrument consisting of a rotating barrel with hundreds of small needles. As the barrel is rolled over the skin, it creates many tiny wounds. These are small enough that they don't cause permanent damage to the skin, but they're also large enough to prompt the skin and hair follicles to rejuvenate. The tiny holes also allow any topical solution that's applied on the skin to be better absorbed. In 2013, a team of scientists in India randomly allocated a group of balding men into two groups. The men were between 20 to 35 years old and had mild to moderate baldness between 3 and 4 on the Norwood Hamilton scale. One group was treated with minoxidil only and the other with a combination of minoxidil and weekly microneedling. In both groups, the men applied 5% minoxidil twice daily. But once a week, the men in the microneedling group had a microneedling session. And on that day, they didn't apply any minoxidil. All of the other days, the men used minoxidil just like the men in the other group. The treatment lasted for a duration of 12 weeks. At the end of treatment, the hair regrowth differences between the two groups were, well, let me see how I can put this. They were actually among the largest differences that you will find in the hair loss literature for any treatment ever. In a target area on the crown that was one centimeter in diameter, men in the minoxidil group had an average of 22 new hairs. But men in the minoxidil plus microneedling group had an average increase of 91 hairs, which is more than a fourfold difference. This is absolutely astonishing, not only for its sheer magnitude, but when you consider that you're comparing an active treatment, not against placebo, but against another active treatment. And these large hair count differences translated into very real cosmetic differences, as judged by a dermatologist who assessed the before and after head photos of the subjects. The dermatologist was blinded to the treatment, meaning that he didn't know if the photos he was assessing were of somebody in the minoxidil only or microneedling group. The dermatologist found that 36% of men in the minoxidil only group had no regrowth, and the remaining 64% had mild or minimal regrowth. But in the microneedling group, every single participant had visible hair regrowth. 20% had minimal regrowth, 44% had moderate, and fully 36 had marked regrowth. From left to right, you can see here the before and after photos of two men in the microneedling group who had marked improvement. Pretty impressive, hey? One thing to mention is that you can get a free derma roller by clicking the link in the description. You simply pay for shipping and handling and we cover the cost of the derma roller. And guys, if you want to learn more about derma rolling, click any of the videos that you can see on the screen now.